Hello, and welcome to Armenian Enough, a podcast about life and identity in the diaspora, with your host, Lara Vanian Green. Hello, and welcome to this episode of Armenian Enough. Today's guest is a labor and delivery physician assistant at the Cleveland Clinic. She's an entrepreneur with her own recruiting company and an Olympic gymnast who competed in the 2016 Rio de Janeiro Summer Olympic Games representing the Republic of Armenia. She is not only the first female gymnast to represent Armenia at the Olympic Games, but she's also the pioneer of a new gymnastics move, aptly called the Gabeshian. <laughs> that is so cool. Um, she continues to inspire young athletes through community leadership, motivational speaking, and recruitment through her company, Full Out Collegiate. Welcome to the show, Huri Gebeshian. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to chat today. Thank you so much for agreeing to do this. I really appreciate it. When I, I was searching Instagram for Armenian gymnasts, and I somewhere in there, like you popped up, and I was like, oh my God. <laughs> And she went to the Olympics. Like, this is amazing because, as you know, my daughter is a gymnast. You're an actual role model in our community. Well, thank you. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. And I mean, it warms my heart that your daughter loves gymnastics because it is a really great sport. I think it sets a really great foundation for anyone, men, women, girls, boys, whoever, to just enjoy the sport and you know, love what they do. So that that's really exciting that your daughter loves it. She does. And like, I'm not used to seeing a lot of, well, first of all, maybe not a lot of Armenian athletes, but certain, there might be some men, but certainly I'm not familiar and maybe I'm just not familiar, but I, I don't know a lot of female Armenian athletes. Yeah. I mean, if you look at the, you know, Armenian Olympic team, the majority of the team are, are male athletes, um, mostly because our strengths are wrestling and weightlifting and, you know, those big manly sports. Um, we do have some women weightlifters and wrestlers. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a pretty male dominated society and male dominated athletic realm. So it was, it was interesting for me to kind of like elbow my way in to the, you know, athletic circle. Yeah, I'm, I have so many questions about your experience at the Olympics with the team. I mean, and we talked a little bit and I was, I just, I'm fascinated to hear how all of that went. But um, taking a step back, I want to first lay a little bit of a foundation and find out like how you grew up, where you grew up, what was your upbringing like in terms of Armenian culture and the role that it played in your life? Yeah. Um, I grew up in Boston, Massachusetts, or just outside of Boston, Massachusetts. Um, we have a pretty big Armenian community in Watertown, Massachusetts, which was, you know, right in my backyard. Um, I wouldn't say I was super involved in the Armenian community. Um, I did go, you know, when I was very, very young, I went to like Sunday school, I went to church. However, you know, my, my parents got divorced really young, which I think 30 years ago was a little bit of a taboo, which maybe it still is. I don't know, but it definitely was 30 years ago. And so that kind of created a, a rift in us being part of the Armenian community, I would say. Were both your parents Armenian? Both of my parents are Armenian. Yep. It was just the fact that they were divorced. Yeah, that happened to my parents too. <laughs> yeah, I think it just like wasn't as common. And it was, you know, like you had to pick one side versus another. And then yes. life got super busy. And that was around when I was like, seven or eight ish. And that's right when gymnastics started being really important in my life. So I started going to the gym, you know, two, three times a week, a couple of hours a week. And it was just more exciting for me to flip around and play with my friends in the gym than it was for me to go to Sunday school and color in a coloring book. Um, I think I actually told that to my mom. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to go to Sunday school anymore. But my sister was more involved with the Armenian community. She had Armenian friends. And I, I didn't really growing up. I, all of my best friends were in the gym. Um, and I kind of came back to the Armenian culture and, and growing as an Armenian in my adult years, I would say. 
Your family is several generations American born, right? No, I'm my sister and I are uh, first generation Armenian Americans. Oh, I'm mm-hmm. sorry. I had that totally wrong. Yeah, my both of my parents uh, grew up in Lebanon and then my grandparents um, grew up in Armenia. Do you know, I just totally assumed that because you said Boston and because I think that we had discussed before that you don't speak Armenian. So I was like, oh, she must be like fourth generation. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I was fluent, 100 percent fluent. You know, I grew up speaking Armenian more than I did English. And then um, I even went to Armenian school when I was in like preschool and kindergarten. And then starting first grade, my sister went up until I think second or third grade. And then I, we both started public school and then English just became the primary language and we didn't use it as much. My sister uses her Armenian way more than me. Like I said, she had more Armenian friends. So she kind of kept up with the language. I didn't as much. You know, I'm like the typical diaspora and I can understand really, really well. I can speak if I practice. I just don't practice that much. So I've, I've lost it in the years. It does come back if I practice. My daughter's in at the gym 20 hours a week, which at 10 and a half seems like a lot, but I don't know. She seems to love it. And half of the time she comes back more energetic than she went in. I am so envious. <laughs> but like, uh, How did it start to become a larger part of your life? Yeah, I think all of us gymists have that same story of like, we were just crazy kids with lots of energy and our parents just needed to find something to to do with us. And that's exactly what (laughs) my parents did. Like my mom took me to a YMCA and they were like, oh, she's actually, she needs to go to a real gym. And once I found a a local gymnastics gym that became my gym for my entire life um, until I went to college, I just, I fell in love. I fell in love with the sport. I think, you know, I also fell in love with the people that were there. My coaches became like my parents, my teammates became like my sisters. And it was really cool to be able to accomplish goals that like I set for myself that I was able to do on my own and kind of gain that independence. I think that's what really drew me to, to the sport. And it gave me a lot of stability through like my parents' whole divorce, which was excellent for me. Um, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I, I think that like it just, it sucked me in and I, I loved every aspect of it. I loved putting in the hard work. I loved seeing the the progress at the end of, you know, accomplishing those goals. And yeah, that's, that's kind of where I ended up. I love that so much. I mean, so many valuable life skills are learned through sports in general, which is it feels so strange to me to say that because I've always been told like, we're not a sporty family, you know, like we're intellectuals um, as though those two things cannot exist at the same time, which I think your existence definitely disproves. (laughs) But I never realized how many analogies you can draw from sports that apply to life in general. 100%. And I mean, I I played soccer as well as gymnastics, but just in gymnastics, you learn so many things, not only about your body and body awareness and learning how to, you know, manipulate your body to do crazy things or just land safely so you don't hurt yourself, you know, all sorts of stuff, but also the determination, dedication, perseverance, you know, goal setting, having a tough mind, all of that comes from athletics uh, that I... 100% bring into my life as a PA, as a physician assistant, as well as in my, you know, own business to just continue pursuing goals and achieving as high as I possibly can. Also, someone else made this point, and I don't remember who or I would credit them, but women don't have as many opportunities as men to engage in team sports and team building. And just the concept of team seems very ingrained in most men. And it, you know, women could use a lot of that. We could use the practice of being on a team. You're an individual person competing at an individual level and also a part of the team cheering on your teammates. It's one of the my, it's one of my favorite things when I see my daughter cheering for her teammates at competition. In fact, sometimes even cheering for other girls just because they've done really really well. Man. They're not on her team at all. That's awesome. I love that. Same. It's like just like warms my heart and there aren't a lot of opportunities. I think I don't know. I mean, I don't want to get too deep, but I but women are seen women often see other women as like competition 
you know, in different arenas in life, you know, there's limited spaces and we're going to compete or limited, whatever fish in the sea. Yeah. <laughs> and this is a really great antidote to something like that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's hard, especially with social media and, you know, young girls looking up to, you know, who knows who and trying to compare themselves. Like the society that we live in right now is is really, really challenging. So being able to surround yourself with good people and good teammates and all of that, I think is is super valuable. So I'm really glad that your your daughter loves gymnastics and she loves her team. And it's it's a good experience for her because I know there's other athletes that don't have a great experience, whether it's in gymnastics or whatever avenue that they take, you know, everybody's going to have a different experience. But luckily for me, I had an amazing experience and I'm glad that your daughter is as well. Yeah, that that is actually really lucky because the culture at the gym is hugely important. We, um, the gym she's at now is not where she started. We had to leave her original gym because we had an abusive coach verbally abusive, mentally abusive, (laughs) but that can be very, very damaging to a young girl's self-esteem. So I talked to my daughter this morning and she was very excited that I'm interviewing you. And I said, what questions would you want to ask? And so she, she rattled off a whole bunch. I probably won't get to all of them, but she was like, (laughs) has she ever had to deal with the mean coach? And like, how did she deal with that? And how has she ever had to deal with bullies at the gym? Cause you know, not every little girl's an angel, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love those questions. I'd be happy to answer them. Um, Just to answer them right now. I had wonderful coaches my entire life. I had, I grew up with the same coaches all throughout my club career. And then um, my coaches in college were also really, really great. They were different than my coaches in club and they had different expectations for me, but I always had a really positive experience. So I can't necessarily give her a really good response of what do you do when you have you know, a hard coach or what was my experience like? Cause I didn't have that experience. Right. And then what was the second question? How do you deal with bullies oh. in the team or in the gym? Yeah, that one that I felt like I dealt with a lot of bullying growing up. Not a well, some in the gym because it's it's an independent sport. Even though you are part of a team, you want your teammates to do well, but you also want you want the gold medal and you want to yeah. do, you know and and a lot of it is one on one competition. And for me, I loved the sport and I didn't really care where I ended up. Like it, it, I just wanted to do the best that I could. And I had teammates that wanted to win. And if I won, it was, they weren't nice. And maybe they didn't talk to me at practice or things like that, that is not ideal. But I think what got me through it is knowing that I was happy with what I was doing. And I was always kind to them no matter what. And at the end of the day, I think athletes or, you know, just young individuals go through that phase of trying to figure out like who they are and who they want to be. And, you know, sometimes it, there's just mean girls out there and and their own frustrations come out as like on you. And for a young girl, you just have to know and feel confident in who you are and and what you're presenting. And, And that's how I got through it. I think a lot more of the challenge was in like grade school when I was super shy. Like I did not talk to anybody. I probably was the best athlete in my high school and nobody had any idea because <laughs> I did, you know, I just, I, I did my sport in my own little club gym and I went to school. I was like a little bookworm and then I left and everyone was like, who's that weird girl, you know? And so like, oh God. like, it's that, like a double life. <laughs> exactly. So like, that's where some of the bullying came into. Because again, like they'd look at me and I had these big muscles. And it was like, who is this? And what, like, what is she doing? And I think, again, just feeling confident in who you are and feeling confident in what you can do um, and being proud of whatever you can do and whatever your accomplishments are, that helps you get through it. And at the end of the day, you don't want to be around mean people. So I have a question based on what you said, because I mean, I know that shyness and confidence can exist together, but how does shyness at school and the (laughs) confidence that you need to have and the lack of shyness to um, do a routine in front of (laughs) 
uh, other people and judges. Like that sounds like my nightmare. But how did you reconcile those things? It's so interesting. I I talk with um, my athletes um, for my recruiting business a lot about this because I think a lot of gymnasts particularly are very introverted and very shy, even though they are amazing humans, right? They flip around on a four inch balance beam high above the ground and they do it with ease, right? And confidence. Um, But then when you're expected to speak to somebody, they're like, oh my gosh, what do I say? What do I do? You know? And so (laughs) it's, it's really interesting. And so for me, I, I didn't do this when I was a child, you know, but now as an adult telling, you know, high school athletes, take the confidence that you have on the beam from, from doing the numbers, from listening to your coach, from whatever it is that allows you to gain that confidence and know that that can be transferred in whatever aspect or whatever field that you're going to or where, whatever conversation that you're having. Like think back at how you feel when you can do the things you feel really comfortable doing and, and put yourself in that situation where you are uncomfortable. And I think that helps them. But when I was a kid, I did not. I was afraid for my life to speak in public and um, I could compete in front of a judge, no problem whatsoever. (laughs) That's amazing. (laughs) But I can see that. I can see as you were speaking, I'm thinking of particular girls at the gym who are very shy in person and amazing. um, I want to say like on stage, but on the competition floor, you know, (laughs) like how is this girl doing this? (laughs) Um, So I know that, Pretty early on, you started having Olympic dreams. Tell me a little bit about about what you were thinking when you were when, when you were a kid about the Olympics. Yeah, I think so. Every kid, you know, has the dream. I'm going to go to the Olympics. I'm going to be amazing. And then at some point, you realize, like, I'm not that good. Like, <laughs> I don't think I'm actually going to go to the Olympics, um, especially in the United States. Like, there's five people that make it on that Olympic team. So, yeah. like, the chances of you being on that is slim. I mean, girls obviously do make it. But for me, I I figured out pretty quickly that that was not going to be my path. And the path that I wanted was just to to take gymnastics as far as I possibly could. When I was in high school, my mom actually brought up the idea of representing Armenia and trying to like, go this Olympic path and, and see where it could take me. And at that point, I, again, was like, Mom, no, like, every parent thinks that their child is going to be an Olympian too. Right. And so I was like, we're not going to kill the dream. (laughs) I'm not, I'm not going to Olympics. Like, no, it's not happening. So I I shot her down when I was in high school. And then when I was in college, I was chatting with my, one of my college coaches who was from Lithuania and he competed internationally uh, for Lithuania. And he brought up like, Hey, you have this opportunity. Like, why don't we explore it? And lucky for me, like the stars kind of aligned, and we had a family friend that wo- like worked as a liaison for the Armenian Olympic Committee, and they like at that same moment were hoping to find more female representation because the International Olympic Committee said that there needed to be more um, female representation on the Armenian Olympic team. And so they, he was like, hey, you know, are you interested in doing this? And I, again, thought to myself, like, no way. Like, I'm not good enough. There's no way. And I'm, you know, comparing myself to the five U.S. Olympians that, that make it to the Olympics. And there's a range of people that do make it. And uh, I went back to my college coach and he was like, you absolutely can do this. Like, let's, let's 100% explore this. And so we did. And I made my first try at the Olympics for 2012. I didn't make it that time, took a couple years off. And luckily, I made it my second round around at uh, in 2016. Okay, well, you glossed over a lot there. <laughs> um, <laughs> so you took some time off. What did that look like for you? <laughs> yeah, I graduated college. And then I, so I had, you know, multiple backup plans for myself. So plan A. You're such a good Armenian. Can I just say like, bravo, bravo for the backup plans. Thank you. Thank you. Tell my parents that. My, it's so She's funny. done a good job. Thank you. Thank you. Because, you know, I mean, you know, the typical, if you don't become a doctor or a lawyer, you're a failure, right? 
Uh, Yes, I do. I have an expensive law degree I'm staring at right now that I have almost never used. It's so funny. Like I I became a physician assistant, so I went into medicine, but I didn't become a doctor. And so I always got the question, well, when are you going to be a doctor? Oh, well, I'm never going to be a doctor. I'm going to be a PA, you know? And my sister, she got, she went to law school and she got her MBA um, and she uses her business degree. And they're like, okay, well, wh- when are you going to be a lawyer? And she was like, I, I'm not, <laughs> like, but I'm successful. So I don't know. I just went on this crazy tangent and I don't even remember what the first question was. <laughs> so- no, no, it was a totally valid tangent because we get pushed into two career choices. I always tell people that I know like I'm an otherwise intelligent person, but believe me, in my early 20s, when I had to, you know, after I graduated from college and I had to pick a career, it was really, it was either going to be law school or medical school. And I was terrible at math and chemistry. So medical school was kind of out (laughs) based on that. And apparently I was some argumentative kid. So they just thought lawyer. There you go. I did not have the wherewithal to think that there were other choices for me. I tr- I feel so silly saying this, but I really, it was like having blinders on. And I thought other people have choices, but I don't. I have to pick one of these. Yeah. And like, I wish I could go back and like shake my younger self by the shoulders and be like, you could do anything you want. Get that psychology degree, you know? You can still get it now. You could do it. I know. You can do what you want. <laughs> but yeah, it's- so funny. Like, I don't know if, if everybody grows up like that, but that's exactly how, how we grew up too. It was like medicine or law. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> but yeah. Anyway. Um, oh, so what did I do in my, in the, in between the two Olympics? Yes. That was the question. So my plan A was um, to make it to the 2012 Olympic games. And mm-hmm. if I didn't make it to the 2012 games, my plan B was to go to PA school. So like at the same time, I was applying for physician assistant programs while I was training for the 2012 games. And then my plan C was if I didn't get into PA school and I didn't make it to the Olympics, I was just going to join the circus and uh, join Cirque du Soleil and do that for, you know, a year or two and then figure out my life after after. I mean, even your (laughs) plan C is kind of awesome. (laughs) It would have been really cool. I, there's part of me that kind of regrets not do, doing Cirque du Soleil because I do have friends that really enjoyed it and I love going to Cirque shows. Um, but I'm, I'm happy with the path that I ended up taking. So I didn't, plan yes. A didn't work out. Plan B did. Luckily, I went to PA school. I went to Wake Forest in North Carolina. I got my degree. And then um, I, I met a boy while I was in my second year of school and he lived up here in Cleveland where I live now. And so when I graduated from graduate school, I decided to move up here to Cleveland. And then I pursued this crazy dream of trying to train for the Olympics again. Okay, but when you went to PA school, you were not thinking that there was another Olympic run in your future, right? You thought, well, that I didn't make it. Uh, yeah, I had no ambition to try again with gymnastics. I left the sport. I was really disappointed not qualifying. I, I ended up being a um, alternate for the 2012 mm-hmm. Olympics. And it's like, nobody is going to drop out of the Olympic Games, even if they're injured or sick or whatever. So being an alternate was the worst. Um, so, so I kind of, and I was disappointed because I, I could have done better and I could have made it. And so I left the sport, not ever wanting to do it ever again. And I went to PA school thinking, okay, I'm going to put all of my effort into medicine and be the best physician assistant I could be. And maybe this will be my passion. And then I, I met this guy and he had a very similar story to me um, as far as like an injury that inhibited him from succeeding in his football career. And then like after graduating from college or I actually can't even remember, he did like a little fun league or whatnot. And he felt like really accomplished for kind of finishing his story. And I was like, you know what? I, I kind of want to finish my story. And he encouraged me to do it. And so I, I kind of just took the leap and was like, okay, well, a year from now, that's going to be my plan. I'm going to find a job as a physician assistant because I need some type of funding to, to be able to get to the Olympic games and train and do all of that. So, and then I'm going to find a gym and I'm going to start training. So that's, that's how it kind of played out. 
that's really insane in the in the sense <laughs> that when most people are training for the Olympics, they're not also working a regular job, right? I mean, yeah, I I mean, I don't think so. <laughs> I think it was pretty unique that I, I did work full time and I trained full time as well as most of like I trained about 20 hours a week and then I worked 40 hours a week. Um, and so what was your schedule like? What was your <sighs> typical daily schedule like? Uh, so lucky for me, I get to work 24 hour shifts at work because, you know, you deliver babies at three o'clock in the morning or at two o'clock in the afternoon. They come whenever. So yeah. I would, when I was training for the Olympics, I would work a 24 hour shift on Sunday and I would work a 16 hour overnight shift on Wednesday. And then I would train at the gym for like four or five day or four or five hours on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. And typically like when I got off of work on Monday morning, I would take about like a three or four hour nap and then I would go <laughs> to the gym. And then, you know, train for a couple of hours, come home, get a really good night's sleep on Monday night, train on Tuesday and do it all over on Wednesday. Oh and then I had to the weekend, you know, Saturday was my day off for sure. Did you have a coach during this time? And you weren't training yourself. You had a, you were working with a coach? Nope. I was all by myself, oh actually. My <laughs> so I mapped out. So I had about two years to get all my skills back and go through the qualifications. There's multiple competitions that you have to go to to qualify to the Olympic Games. So I mapped out, you know, the next two years of my life and I mapped out my diet. I mapped out my strength and conditioning. I mapped out my, you know, skill progression, my routines, my work schedule, my travel, like everything was planned for, for two years. And cause I was, I was on my own. I didn't have the resources to hire a coach and the, the wonderful gym. I found a gym here that hosted me and they let me train. They said, the door is open for you. You can train whenever you want. Um, they let me do that for free, which was, you know, amazing. Um, and Unheard they just said, of. Uh, totally unheard of. They're the most wonderful family at Gymnastics World here in Ohio. If anybody is in the Cleveland area, they're is wonderful Is that what humans. it's called? Yep, Gymnastics World. Um, That's gymnastics, I'm sorry, but like Gymnastics yeah. World is the name of my daughter's gym here in really? Chatsworth, California. Yeah. Small world. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'm sure it, it's not the same. I know this is just a one off. It's not a <laughs> yeah. chain or anything, but I, no. I do love that. Mm -hmm. Well, um, they are, you know, a wonderful family that that owns the business. It sounds like your gymnastics world is wonderful as well. So yes. go gymnastics world. <laughs> um, but yeah, they, they just said, you know, you can train whenever you want. Um, we don't necessarily have a coach that we could dedicate to you, but you know, our coaches are here if you need help here and there, but I would just, I would go in before any of the other athletes would show up, you know, after school or whatever, I would be there in the mornings and I would put myself through the workouts. We had, um, like video cameras in the gym so I could videotape myself, um, yes. to try and like coach myself through things um, and teach myself the things that I needed to. But it was mostly just remembering what I used to do and teaching myself a few new things and just keeping sticking to the plan and keeping keeping going. Um, that was the hardest part, you know, showing up by myself, turning the lights on and saying, OK, I'm going to do this again with three hours of sleep. Like it's let's do it. I mean, to have that kind of tenacity and focus and dedication and discipline for two years, did you ever have moments? I mean, you must have had moments where you were like, this is crazy. What am I doing? Why am I torturing myself? I, mean I definitely did, um, especially at the beginning, because I had taken it had been about three years from doing gymnastics that like I stepped back in the gym and I barely exercise. I had to exercise a little bit while I was in PA school, but PA school is tough. Like you don't have time to do anything other than study. And so, you know, I gained weight. I was out of shape. I, you know, completely had to start over. And those first couple of months were so challenging because I, I had to just get in shape and I had to start from, you know, handstands and four rolls and cartwheels, like the, the bare, bare minimum. And I remember walking in the door and, and telling, you know, the owners of the gym and telling the coaches and the athletes that like randomly saw me working out. Yeah. You know, my goal is the Olympics. And they were like, this girl is doing cartwheels. Like, how did she go to the Olympics? <laughs> Amazing. Like, what did you, this is what I'm really interested in because it applies to any area of life when you're trying to 
pursue a goal or change a habit or something that is important to you. We, we all have those moments of massive self-doubt and where we just want to throw everything out the window. Like, what did you tell yourself during the low moments that kept you going? I actually, so I had a really great mentor, which was um, my, my college coach, actually, the one that originally said, hey, yeah, you, you can do this. And he was wonderful. He was just a really good sounding board for me whenever I did have that self-doubt. I felt really challenged when I first started, but I knew that I could get through it because it was just like I had to get in shape. But as I was leading up to the Olympics, there was a little part of me that even after I qualified, I, you know, there was a couple of months between qualification and actually competing at the Olympic Games where I was like, I'm going to make a fool of myself when I get there. Like, I'm not good enough. I can't be competing on this stage. And my coach, Linus, he was like, you've qualified. You've made it there. You've done everything. You've put in this hard work. Like, where is this coming from? And he was like, get on it. He lived in Denver. He's the University of Denver's college coach right now. And he was like, just come spend a weekend, get all the jitters out. You're, you're totally fine. And I'm so thankful that I had him throughout the process just to kind of level me back down to just say like, no, you're good enough. Even if I, you know, had that self doubt, or even if I wasn't as amazing as the U S athletes, like I still put the hard work in to accomplish whatever this dream was of mine. And I just, I think it's so important to have those people around you that can uplift you when you absolutely need it. And and Linus was that for me. Yeah, that's so great that you had somebody there for you, because we all have that voice, right? Mm -hmm. The crazy aunt in the attic, who's always telling you what's wrong, and how you're never going to do any like, wherever that voice comes from, we all have it by the time we're, you know, probably even 10 years old. Yeah. And, And if you listen to it, you will kill all of your dreams. Yeah, you'll go nowhere. <laughs> that was very dramatic of me, but but, but it's actually true. Yeah. So tell me how you got into the Olympics the second time. It all started by like gaining my citizenship. So I had to become a dual citizen uh, first. And I gained that in like when I was in college. Um, and, and how then, difficult was that? Sorry, because I, oh, I yeah. mean, I'm just, just want to lay it out for someone who might be able to do this. How do you trace back your ancestry? Like, what is it difficult? What do they need to give you Armenian citizenship? Yeah, it's actually not that difficult. So if anybody is interested in becoming a dual citizen, definitely do it. You just go through, there's an application that you have to fill out through the like consulate or the embassy website, which is, it, this is a lot easier nowadays, like 10 years ago or whenever it was that I did it. I had to like go to Armenia and I had to fill out the paperwork in Armenia and it was all in Armenian too. And I was like, I can't read this. Like, (laughs) what is this? And they were like, just sign your name here. I was like, okay. So sign my name. And then there was a test I had to take, which also was in Armenian. And (laughs) so I was like, what am I doing? And they're like, just sign your name here. Okay, great. Sign my name. I paid some money and they were like, okay, we'll process your paperwork. And then I went home and then a couple months later, I had to come back and pick up my passport. Like that was it for me. So I was like, okay, "Okay, great. But now the actual process, you just fill out the application, you pay whatever the fee is, the, you have to show some type of heritage, some type of background to like your lineage to Armenia. Um, So if you're Mm -hmm. able to show like birth certificates or whatever um, that connect you to your heritage, great. If you have none, you all you have to do, well, not all you have to do, but if you're interested, you can also be baptized in the Armenian church and that counts. And Get then, out. Yeah. I was baptized when I was 13 at Etchmiadzin. Oh, really? <laughs> wow. That's it. Claiming the heritage now. There you go. So <laughs> now you can apply. Um, and But you do still have to go to Armenia to like pick up your paperwork, which I'm not quite sure why. We have mail, but... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry. I was just, I didn't mean to like stop you um, for anyway, whatever. Yeah, no. So that's sorry. it. That, that's I the will process. edit out my own verbal blunders. No, I love um, that. I love that you were baptized in Etchmiazin. Like, I mean, that's pretty unique. That's amazing. 
Yeah, my mom just wanted me to be conscious. She's like, I don't like the idea of baptizing babies. Like they don't know what's happening. It's not, they don't have a choice. And she wanted me to be aware and she wanted to like make it special and take me to Armenia. So I was 13 when that happened. That's Um, amazing. So did you have a choice in it when you were 13? Like, could you have said, no, I don't want to do this? I mean, theoretically, but I was like, I don't care. I mean, we're not a religious family, but I was like, sure, put some, you know, put some water on me. (laughs) Like, bless me. Okay. Yeah. Um, Cool. Yeah. It was an interesting experience. I didn't know that was uh, that was enough to grant me citizenship, but <laughs> yeah. So now you can become a dual citizenship if you fill out the paperwork and pay the fees and go to Armenia to pick up your passport. Okay, so what was your experience like? So now you've qualified. Then you have two months where you're doing what between this and going to the Olympics. So a lot of my Olympic journey was for myself, but also for everybody else that supported me in this process. And my hopes were that I could like increase the visibility of Armenian athletes, um, especially female athletes for Armenia. And so that was a really big push that I was doing. Once I qualified, you know, and I kind of could like breathe a little bit. I did a ton of speaking engagements. I traveled. I like really want, I was super active on my social media because I, I wanted people to join the journey because it was, it was an amazing experience for myself, but I wanted everybody else to feel like they were part of this experience too. And hopefully, you know, encourage anybody, you know, young athletes, definitely, but anybody to follow, you know, their dream and be able to accomplish whatever it was that they wanted to. And so that's a lot of my time was spent doing that in those two, two, three months. I also doing it in, in the U S or in Armenia Sorry. in, in the U S. Okay. Yep. yep. So I did tons of traveling in the U S. Um, I did end up going to Armenia afterwards through the birthright Armenia program, which was amazing, which we can talk about later too. Mm-hmm. But I did a lot of that. I, I still had to train and I really wanted to like have my name in the books somehow. Like I knew I wasn't going to get a gold medal. That was, that was a far stretch here. And so I thought to myself, okay, well maybe I can make it into a final, which also really big stretch. So then I was like, maybe I can invent a skill. And really, this is like, Oh, go on. Sorry. Yeah, no. So this is like when it, when it kind of came about like just a couple of months before the Olympic games, I was like, I'm going to make, I'm going to invent a skill. I'm going to figure out something that nobody else has ever done. And I'm going to do it at the Olympic games and I'm going to get it named after myself. And so I looked, we, we have like this, this rule book basically that has all of the skills listed in there. And so I, I just, I read through it and I was like, okay, well, every skill has been done. Like, what can I do? What can I possibly do that nobody else has done? And so the mount that I did on uneven bars, I would jump from the low, like I would jump, push off the low bar, go over it. And then I would catch the high bar that was in the code. And then there was a box. They're like in little boxes. The next box was like you can jump over the bar without touching it. Okay, that was in the code. And then there was you can jump over the box, do a full twist, and catch the bar without touching the low bar. That was in there. But there wasn't you touch the low bar like I do on my mount, do a full spin in the air, and then catch the high bar. And I said, I'm going to do this. This is going to be my skill. And so I spent like months and months and months, like smacking the bar, falling on my head, (laughs) landing in a dead hang. This is the movie montage of all like all the fails. I should have videotaped. uh, I mean, I have a few fails, but I should have videotaped the progress. And one of my college teammates, actually one of my best friends, she came to visit me and she was just playing around on the trampoline and she was like, oh, it's so easy. Like, you just have to do this. And she, we like figured out some drill to do on the trampoline. And she like, thank goodness she showed up because after that, I started actually figuring out how to do it. And then I put it in my routine. And lucky for me, I actually caught the bar at the Olympic Games. And now I have that skill named after me. Woo. Woo-hoo. Yeah. <laughs> Did you compete on all the events at all the events? Yep. So the way that I qualified to the Olympics was as an all arounder. So I qualified, yeah, doing all four events. Wow. Tell me what your experience was like with the Armenian Olympic team. It was really interesting because 
they were they were friendly, they were welcoming. However, they all knew each other, right? They trained together, they went to competitions together, they knew who they were, and they were like, who is this rich white girl showing up trying to pretend like she's part of the team, you know? And like, I'm far from a rich white girl. You know, I have worked my butt off my entire life to get to where I am. I paid for my entire way to get to the Olympics. I worked my butt off. I coached myself like. But you're American, so you're rich. (laughs) Exactly. So don't assume, you know, don't make this some strain. But I mean, we we do have luxuries that they may not, you know, that's fine. Mm -hmm. So Immediately when I walked in, like that was just the the thought. Well, you're the only woman, right? I for gymnastics. There was other there was other females. Um, so okay. I roomed with two weightlifters that were they were wonderful. Um, they were very kind, and we had I can't remember if we had female wrestlers. I don't think we did, but we had those two weightlifters. We had a few track and field female athletes, a few swimming athletes, and then me. And then we had the men's you know, boxing, weightlifting, like shooting. I don't I guess that's like something. And track and field, swimming, and maybe a couple of other things. But yeah, there was like, a, I think there was 20, 21 of us, maybe total. So it was, it was a good little bunch. But again, like they, they knew each other. They obviously, they spoke the language, which I didn't as well. And my Armenian, sure. again, you know, Eastern and Western Armenian, it's always challenging when like yeah. I, you know, it, it's so hard for me to understand them, especially when they speak so fast. So it was just really hard to co- connect with them. But once I actually competed, because I was one of the first days to compete and it was actually really nice. Like people came and watched me. I watched them. After I competed, they were like, oh, she's, she's legit. Like she can do the sport. She is representing it. Like I was all about Armenia, you know, like I, this is my culture. This is my, my heritage. Like I am going to hopefully do it justice by representing us well, doing a really great job and hopefully being an excellent representation of our country. And I think they saw that administrative people saw that the athletes saw that. And after I competed, I gained, you know, a little bit more respect from everybody. And I was included a little bit more, which was nice. And it was, it was definitely an interesting experience. I I had to gain their trust for sure. And once I did, I, I was welcomed in a little bit more. What did it feel like for you to like be in the Olympic village and see all the other, like, what was that experience like? It was, it was cool for sure. We, so all the different countries live in like different apartment. They're these like high rise apartment complexes kind of. Uh-huh. And so all of the countries have different apartments as you got. I think there was like 20 different apartments. The big countries had the first few. So they had like the nice apartments. So the US, Canada, Russia, they had these nice like furnished apartments. By the time you got, I think we were like, 17 the apartment number 17 Mm -hmm. and ours we like barely had furniture and ours like they definitely ran out of time (laughs) building the the (laughs) olympic village by the time they got to us but it was it kind of reminded me of college because your friends were just right down the hall right or like two apartments down you could go outside go to the next apartment and go to team you know usa or whoever it was and and go just chit chat with whoever you wanted so that was that was really cool. There, you know, was a it's a huge dining hall. So all the athletes go there. You mingle with whoever you want to while you're there, and it's I mean it's pretty big. There's a little tram that takes you around. You can walk from one side to the other, but there's a nice little tram, um, and it was just really cool to see everywhere you looked. There were people that were at the top of their game in whatever sport that they were playing, and it was amazing to be just surrounded by all of those, those individuals. Like you had no clue who spoke English, who spoke whatever language, but you could be as friendly as possible. You know, it was really interesting because I was wearing all Armenian gear and a bunch of people would come up to me and speak Russian and I do not speak Russian. (laughs) And I was like, no, I speak English. Like I'm from the U S so uh, it was, that was a fun experience, but did your family attend the games? Um, my dad did, and my stepmom did, my uncle did, and my boyfriend, fiance at the time, did. And my mom had come like a, to the qualification 
like the couple months before. Um, so that was also in Brazil. How insanely proud must your family have been? It was, I mean, I think it was a really cool experience for them too. I, I mean, when I first told them that I was going to try again for the Olympics, they all thought I was crazy. They were like, you're old, you have a career, you like, why are you wasting your time on this silly dream? And then when I actually made it to the Olympics, they were like, look at my daughter. She's at the Olympics. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. so it, was, it was, it was a cool experience for them for sure. That's really cool that you were able to shut all of that out because that could have stopped you too. You could have been like, even my parents think that I'm, you know, not going to make it. I'm too old. I'm too, whatever. I have a career. What am I doing? Yeah. But how amazing that you followed through and saw your dream to the end. Thank you. Yeah. I was, I was, I was really happy. I did for sure. <laughs> yeah. You should be very, very proud of yourself. Thank you. And all the stuff that you're doing now, I don't, I don't want to skip your experiences in Armenia, but when you had the opportunity to go back to Armenia with the Birthright Foundation, were you there specifically for gymnastics and women's gymnastics or did you go with another agenda? My agenda was to try and grow Armenian women's gymnastics, specifically the artistic gymnastics that I do. We have a pretty strong rhythmic gymnastics program. Um, on the women's side, but the artistic gymnastics is, is not as robust. And so those years leading up to the Olympics, I was really trying to gain momentum and gain recognition and gain funding and all of that stuff so that I could go to Armenia and really try and catapult us to, to have more representation, to provide them some resources so that we could have athletes training in the gym. When I first went there in 2010, it was very much like women don't sweat. Like that's, that's not, <laughs> that's not what they do. You know, when they turn 16, they are helping in, you know, they're helping in the kitchen, they're finding a husband and they're getting married and having babies. When I went back in 2019, the culture shifted a little bit. I think it's definitely, it's still modernizing. It still has some places to grow, but I did see a little more of a shift you know, almost 10 years later, thank goodness. And mm -hmm. so I really took that opportunity to try and network with as many people as I could really gain some momentum, which I did. And then COVID happened, which really kind of put a damper on everything. And so now I'm like really trying to kind of get back into the swing of things and gain some more momentum kind of moving forward. Because we have a few athletes in Armenia that are interested in our good. It's just, it all comes down to funding and resources. Like they're not gonna, it's like a backwards mentality, right? Like, oh, if you win, then you'll get money. Well, you can't win if you don't have the resources to get good enough to win. Right. And so I mean, that seems basic. <laughs> right. And especially when all of your resources go to the men's side, which they do win, they are really, really great, but have a little bit of it trickle over to the, to the women's side. So I'm trying really hard through the Birthright Armenia program. I, we have four gyms actually in Armenia, which I did not even know. We have our main one in Yerevan and then there's three others. So I visited all of those. I talked to, you know, the like department of sports or whatever it's called out there, like all of these higher ups. And I'm, I'm really trying to reconnect again because we do have more Armenian Americans that are interested in following my footsteps and representing them. And I'm, I'm just hoping with more interest, we can continue growing this and see where it goes. It, it's really interesting how it seems to still be modeling the old Soviet style. Like it's still, they're all connected to the government somehow. Yes, everything is connected to the government, which is which is really interesting. Like here in the States, like you pay to go to gymnastics for or you're you pay for your daughter to go to gymnastics. And that's the lesson that they're doing. In yes. Armenia, it's like, it's like an after school activity that's funded by the government for your kids to oh, go see. and do gymnastics. Man, I wish it was funded by the government. That is a, that is a hefty bill I pay every month. Well, I know. Well, well, that's why. Like, I I don't think the government gives them enough money to actually develop athletes because I don't know what the cost of building a program is. I mean, it's it's pretty expensive, but I don't think the government really invests 
the money into women's gymnastics like they do men's gymnastics. So that's why it's kind of lagging. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I wonder if like, we could go visit the we're planning a trip to Yerevan in September. Well, we're going in September. And um, that would be really interesting to drop in and see if we could visit a gym there. Yeah, drop in. There's one, yeah, right in Yerevan. There's one in Gumri. Um, there's one in Vanadzor. And then there's one more, which I can't remember where that last one. But yeah. How cool. That'd be so fun for your daughter to to train there. Does she speak Armenian? Uh, like you and maybe less. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I train there with my very minimal Armenian. So um... I mean, I'm not like my Armenian's a big deal. A lot of it is gone. I used to be a lot more fluent and... Yeah you know, but we'll be with my dad. So maybe he can sort of intervene and that would would be cool just to see how it's different. You know, you will be shocked by what they are doing with the limited resources that they have. They're great athletes. They, it's just really hard to be able to progress much of anything when you have no pits, when you have a beam that's just wood, you know, like, Oh God, it's, it's challenging when all of your mats are, you know, ripped apart. Like it's, it's not ideal. Oh, that's really sad. Yeah. We're working on it. Yeah. No, I'm really glad because that feels like something that Armenians could be really, really good at if given half a chance. Yeah, definitely. I mean, our, like I said, our men are really great. So They put that effort into our women, we would totally be great as well. (laughs) Tell me a little bit about how you started your recruiting business. So my business partner, her name is Wendy. She actually has two kids that did gymnastics at Gym World. So she has a son and a daughter who were doing gymnastics. And we actually met while I was training at the gym for the Olympics. And she would just like watch me training by myself. And she'd be like, who is that girl? And then we ended up becoming friends. And then as I was training alongside, you know, some of the high school athletes that were at our gym, they kept asking me, you know, well, what do I do? How do I get into college? How do I get on a team? Like, how did you do it? What, it, what's the process, all of this stuff. And so I guided them through a lot of, you know, a lot of what it is, is just networking, being able to chat with different coaches, being able to advocate for yourself, like kind of breaking out of that introverted shell that most gymnasts have and, Mm -hmm. you know, putting yourself out there and, and talking to the right people. And so I coached them and guided them through that process because they were, they were excellent. They had great gymnastics. They were great students. They just like were missing that little piece. And so after I did it with a a few athletes, I thought, huh, like there's really a need for for this type of coaching. Why don't I make it into something that's legit and that could bring some money in maybe? (laughs) And so I found Wendy um, who has a business background, which I don't have. And I was like, you know, I have the product. I just need somebody to help me make it something that can be sold, you know, worldwide or like make it more legit or whatever. And she was like, let's do it. So we started this business in 2017, right after I finished the Olympics. I was like, I can't do it while I'm doing all this stuff. (laughs) And so after I came back, we kind of built the product up. um, And then we launched it. And it's been it's been really successful for the past you know, a couple of years. I, I mean, the last time I counted, we were over 60 athletes that were placed in different colleges all over the United States on different teams and have had really great experiences with all of our athletes. So it's been a fun process. If somebody is in the first year or two of high school and a promising gymnast, what should they be doing now to sort of prepare themselves for college gymnastics? Yeah. So if anybody is interested in college gymnastics, this time to start thinking about it is when you're going into high school, which is really crazy because these young athletes are just worried about starting high school, let alone, you know, thinking about college. (laughs) Like that's, you know, four years away. That's scary, but that's actually this time to start thinking about it. And then the best thing to do is just start building a profile and building a resume and Instagram is kind of the place to, to start. And just getting content of the gymnastics that they're doing and then starting the outreach, depending on the level of gymnastics will determine 
the like coaches that they should be reaching out to, whether that is through social media, through email, or whatever platform that they can, because they can do a lot of reaching out to coaches and talking at them, but coaches are not allowed to respond back until after their sophomore year. So those first two-ish years, they kind of just build their resume up. Once um, sophomore year finishes and they um, have put their name out there, hopefully coaches will start calling them, asking them to come on visits and things like that. And then all of the active recruiting starts, you know, junior and senior year. And then are you also recruiting gymnasts for Armenia or for the Olympics team in Armenia? Yes, um, I absolutely am. And I'm really excited about it because I just met a few athletes a couple of months ago at our like U.S. national championships, like our level 10 national championships. And there was three athletes that are age eligible to start competing for Armenia if they wanted to. So I talked to them. I talked to their parents. What is that age? So to be a quote unquote senior, you have to be 16. They could compete as a junior if they wanted to. It's not as rewarding. Um, It's more just an experience. So once you hit 16, you can start going through like the qualification to get to an Olympic Games if they want to. So I chatted with all of their parents. I chatted with them. I talked to them about the whole citizenship process and they're interested. And um, I have, you know, two other athletes that are currently in college that are Armenian Americans that I'm trying to convince to, to compete as well. So we could potentially have a little team, which is super, super exciting. For me. That would be so cool. Yeah. I mean, yes. <laughs> Thank so the we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, and originally that was my goal was to try and build up the Armenian Americans to compete for Armenia, get the, you know, maybe not necessarily medals, but maybe who knows, but right. like do well enough that then the government sees, oh, okay, let's put some funding into Armenian women's gymnastics, and then elevate the sport from there. So it's taking time, but we're slowly chipping away at it. Is there any point at which you would say, like, what if some a girl's 14 and level six? Do you think it's too big of a gap? Like, she's got to be level 10 by what age to be able to make it? Or do you think that it doesn't have to follow a prescribed route? I mean, I don't, it depends on what the goals are, right? If the goals are, we're trying to build a team to make it to the Olympic games, then, you know, you have to hit a certain level and have the skills to be able to get there. However, that's such a small percentage of athletes. I would love to have, you know, you have to start from somewhere. So even if it's a 14 year old, that's a level six, if we have this community of Armenian female gymnasts, let's build it up and continue to grow from the ground up and that starts with everyone so yeah if your daughter wants to join is that where we're we're talking yeah, about here <laughs> she's 10 she's she's 10 and a half so i wasn't using her as an example but there's yeah. another girl at the gym that i was thinking of another armenian girl dude um <laughs> half of her last year she was on silver because we do excel but yeah. half of her team was armenian I know I really got to get out to California and start recruiting. I mean, I'm not saying that that's the norm. I don't think I've ever seen it like that. It just happened to be like that. The owner of our gym is Persian. So I think we just like, we understand each other, even though we don't speak the same language. So we all like have the same kind of values, kind of understanding. Yeah. And yeah, I'm like, look at all the Armenians on your team. I know I gotta, <laughs> I, I do really need to get out to California because it's like, There's a bunch in California, there's a bunch in Massachusetts, and then there's like a few sprinkled here and there. But yes, I would love, I mean, I would love to just start from, from somewhere, even doing like a, like a weekend camp or something like that. So everybody can meet each other, they can work together and, you know, build friendships and bonds. I'm, I'm really, I'm trying. (laughs) I have my, I have my hands in like a million pots right now, but um, (laughs) that's, that's my dream. That is really my dream. I would really love that. And I mean, I'm not going to speak for the owner. However, he is a close friend. So uh, I really think that our our gym would be happy to host something like that. Great. It, that would be amazing. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please don't forget about that pot. <laughs> I won't. I won't. It's been it's been here for since I started. And it's just been hard to kickstart and get going. But 
I'm hoping, you know, the big thing is, is, you know, my student loans, once my student loans are paid off, then I can do, you know, I can be free to do whatever I want, but (laughs) the student loans are weighing me down. Yeah. Thanks, Supreme Court. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) I know. Seriously. (laughs) Thanks for not helping. Um, Oh, my God. Thank you so much for talking to us. You are just such a positive, energetic, like, breath of fresh air. And it's just so cool to have someone championing Armenian women's sports. Thank you. I I mean... I never thought this is what I would be doing, especially with my, you know, upbringing. I, w- I wasn't, like I said, I wasn't as involved in the Armenian community. I feel like it was something that wasn't part of my identity. And as I grew as an adult, I, I really missed that part. And I, I think it's so hard, like when you're not associated with the church or, you know, that type of stuff to feel included. And yeah. now as an adult, I, I realized like, you don't necessarily have to be to be Armenian and to feel good about your heritage and to feel like you belong. And so I'm, I'm really grateful that I had gymnastics bring me back to this culture. I think it's an asset, to be honest with you, because if you'd grown up with the culture, you might have also unconsciously picked up some of the attitudes of like, oh, this isn't possible or, oh, they don't care about the women's stuff. Like it might have dissuaded you in a way like you needed that fresh, opt- that American optimism. <laughs> you needed it to <laughs> do the things that you did. Uh, maybe. I, I think. I, I like that thought. I do. <laughs> I do. I, I mean, I would say like my parents, you know, they are very traditional. It's just not something I embraced so much. But I do think I'm a blend of Armenian. I'm a blend of American. And this is what it ended up as. And I love it. Oh, it's beautiful. I'm so excited about the things that the things that I see in your future and the thing, the role that I see you playing. I think you're more of a pioneer than maybe you realize. I I think this is going to be amazing. Well, I hope to be. Yeah, thank you. So we like to wrap up our podcast with five fun questions. Are you game? Oh, I forgot about these. (laughs) I was supposed to prep them and and listen to the podcast to prepare, and I forgot what they were. Oh, no. Pressure's on. (laughs) Good. Uh, Question number one, what is your favorite Armenian food? Oh, my favorite Armenian food. I really like... Sarma, or I don't, I like the rolled up grape leaves. We call it Sarma, yeah. but we call them Sarma. I mean, at the restaurants and stuff, they'll call them Dolma, but I think, like, you know, de- Dolma for us is stuffed um, bell pepper. Yes, exactly. Or zucchini. Yes. Yes. All right. We're on the same page. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody make me stuffed zucchini. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do you understand both Western and Eastern Armenian? Uh, no. <laughs> Do you understand Western? Um, Western, yeah, my family speaks Western. I grew up speaking Western. I understand Western. Eastern is very challenging for me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if they didn't add Russian words, would Eastern be easier? Or just speak so fast. I feel like they're, <laughs> or like mumble. I don't know. I, it's so hard for me. <laughs> no, it's hard for me too. There's a lot of slang and there's a lot of like really dramatically different words. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, no, I'm with you on that one. I mean, I do understand Eastern Armenian, but when I'm in Armenia, I feel like, do I understand Eastern Armenian? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> okay. Number three, what is the most Armenian thing about you? I mean, I guess representing Armenia at the Olympic Games would be yeah, the most Armenian thing. <laughs> You're like the flag on my uh, competition uniform. Yeah, it's cool. It's it's actually we're we're not on video right now, but I do have my leotard framed. My my boyfriend framed it for me a couple of years ago for my birthday because I was saying I wanted it framed forever, and it's hanging up like right behind me in my office. So. I saw that photo of you holding the the like the shadow box basically oh, yeah. with the Leo in it on your Instagram, and I was like, "This is so adorable! Like, it's just so cool." And um, good job on the boyfriend too. Like, he's cute. He is, he is, he is wonderful. <laughs> oh, I'm so happy to hear that. Number four is who is your favorite Armenian celebrity? Oh, my favorite Armenian celebrity. I, I mean, I guess I like System of a Down. They're okay. a good Armenian band. Yes. And last but not least, do you know how to read Armenian coffee cups? 
I do not. My aunt does, and I've always wanted to learn. But it's like, you know, everything in Armenian culture, it's like, no, 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 I'll do it for you. I'll do it for you. At some point, I got to learn these things. Like, I got to learn how to cook. I got to learn how to read these coffee cups. But no, yes. I don't know. I don't know how to how to read them. I wish I did. So you gotta be like me, like when I drink Armenian coffee and I turn it over, I used to do it with my mom all the time, but now uh, my mom's passed. So I just give it to my daughter and I'm like, just tell me what you see. No wrong answers. That's <laughs> perfect. Do you have, um, you're in Cleveland, right? Correct. So is there any, do you have the ability to make Armenian coffee? Um, yeah, I can. Do you have it like, do you have a little Jesvin coffee? And stuff I do home? not. I, so like, I don't like, I mean, I don't, does anybody actually like the taste of Armenian coffee? I mean. Yes. <laughs> You've offended 99% of my listeners. No, I'm just kidding. But it's, <laughs> I do. I do. Do you? Okay. I do not like the taste of it. I don't ever make it. Um, Fair. I don't have a little, you know, pot or whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, but I could. I very well could. I know how to make it. But no, I don't have it. Okay. Well, I was going to say, if you had it, like, drink a cup and snap some photos of it, like, when the coffee grounds dry. Because one of the things we do on our Instagram is interpret people's coffee cups. And I love when I can have a guest coffee cup for people to interpret. I will remember that because, I mean, we do, so we have a little Armenian community here in Cleveland, which is awesome. I like, when I moved to the Cleveland, I was like, there's not going to be any Armenians here. And there actually is a really good, we have a church right down the street and a nice little community that I love. So next time I'm hanging out with everybody, I will force myself to drink the coffee and flip my cup and take a picture of it. <laughs> you can ask for it to be made really sweet. And honestly, you can just like touch it to your lips and then pour the rest of the coffee out. Just symbolic. You, know, you just need to turn it over. You don't need to wire yourself with all that caffeine for the day. <laughs> but yeah, no, no press. Okay. Uh, just just Perfect. keep it in mind. Okay. I love that. Thank you so much for everything that you're doing and just for being an amazing role model and human being. Like the amount of drive to see this dream to the end is super impressive. And I hope that you do give yourself that little pat on the back every day. Like I hope it I hope it hasn't become normal for you after all these years to say, like, oh yeah, I was in the Olympics, whatever. Like I hope you're still like, wow, I did that. Thank you. It's it's funny because it's not so, it's not like I introduce myself and I'm like, yeah, you know, I went to the Olympic Games. But anytime I'm with like a friend or my boyfriend, they're like, you know, you want to know a fun fact about her? You know, and so like it always comes out somehow, but it's never me that's like, yeah, you know, I did this. Cause okay, you're humble, but like it's an impressive, impressive achievement. Thank you. Thank you. I am proud of it, but thank you very much. Thank you so much for talking to us and for coming on our podcast. It has been an absolute pleasure. You can reach Huri at it feels so weird to say your Okay, how do you say your name in English? Because I feel like when I'm saying it, I'm saying it almost in Armenian. Well, I mean, it, technically, you should just... I'm trying to get people to say it like it should be said with the rolled R. So it's Huri. But okay. it's really hard for people. So Americans, I tell them that it's kind of like Huri and the Blowfish. Because <laughs> it's really hard for people to roll their R's. So more than more often than not, people just call me Hootie. <laughs> so That's it's close. Really funny. I mean, people can't even say Lara, and I don't think it's a difficult name. I'm like, the R is like in car. It's Lara, and they're like, okay, Laura. I'm like, no, 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 <laughs> step back. But no. okay, you can reach Hootie at Full Out Recruit on Instagram, and the company's website is www. Fulloutrecruit.com. There will be more links to her Instagram and possibly her email in the show notes for this episode. Thank you so much for joining us today. And remember, until next time, that you are always more than enough.